I am so glad you've tuned in today. Today we start a series of messages based on Roger Alfred's book called Pastoring Isn't All That It's Cracked Up To Be, It's More. As a matter of fact, Roger's going to be here and he's going to lead us in these sessions and you'll want to tune in as you watch these sessions. This is a phenomenal book. At the bottom of your screen during the video, you'll see an address that you can call and get a copy of this book for $10. And it's worth every penny. It's really worth more. So you contact Roger and you get this book. In this book, you'll find all kinds of truths. He'll talk to you about the pastor being the champion of the church. He'll talk about pastor how the pastor needs to guide the church. He talks about le uh, lessons from Amos and Hosea, biblical characters that can help you understand the proper process of being a pastor of a local church. He gives you real life experiences and he'll touch your heart. I'm so pleased to introduce to you Roger Alford and he's president of New Faith Ministries. It's located in O'Fallon, uh, Missouri and you'll benefit from being in contact with him. So you listen as we listen to Roger. All right, so we welcome you back to our Bible lesson today. We're on lesson number two. A pastoring isn't all it's cracked up to be, it's more. And uh, I'm so glad to have this opportunity to share with you our pastors and church leaders and praying this is a blessing to you. So here in lesson number two, we're gonna think about uh, days in seminary and, and uh, very first full-time church and what you might glean, glean from this for yourselves. So after, uh, after college and I was drafted and I was in the army, after I got out of the army, uh, I went to seminary and uh, struggled with that for a while, uh, if I should even go or not, because God does send some men to seminary and some he doesn't. So just make sure you're doing whichever way God leads you to do. But God did teach me a lot while I was at seminary. It wasn't so much the material uh, that I was learning, the, the books, uh, because Ecclesiastes said of the making of many books, there is no end. By the time you think you've got enough books in your library, go to a Christian bookstore, you can buy a hundred more. It's the book that counts, and that's the Bible. And, uh, but it wasn't necessarily material. It was the men I sat under their teaching and, and gleaning from them, like sitting at the master's feet and gleaning from the spirit in which they taught it and the experiences of their own life. That's what I really learned and what blessed me uh, at seminary. I had the spirit of sitting uh, under some spiritual giants. I heard a saying, if you want to be a spiritual giant, you need to hang around some spiritual giants. And praise God, I had a, a few professors at seminary who indeed were spiritual giants. And I got to hear from them firsthand about how God had been moving in their own lives and firsthand some great principles of scripture. And I was also exposed to other things in seminary, other great brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus and learning from them and uh, others who've been called in the ministry. I learned of various resources, other ministries, uh, about the missionaries that around the world, other ideas, other methods. I, I became more broad-minded and less legalistic. I realized just the way I was taught uh, into certain churches where I was raised in, there was a whole lot more to Christianity than this, just that particular uh, branch of the tree that I had been exposed to. Christianity is so broad. And I had to broaden my thinking because uh, the Bible is pretty broad covering all aspects of life. And so it helped me widen my horizons and feel like I didn't have to part my hair like everybody else parted their hair. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul put it this way. He says, now I say this, verse 12, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. It's easy to follow a certain preacher or a certain style of preaching or a certain style of ministry. Uh, but let's not get hung up on the style. It's, it's, it's the central point is Jesus Christ. I love to go to a cafeteria, for instance. I like everything on the menu. Some people only want this, that, or the other. But the Bible offers a, a lot of, of options here in Christianity. And Jesus uh, said it another way over in, in Mark. Uh, the disciples had been in another town. And uh, John came up to Jesus and he said over here in Mark uh, chapter, uh, where am I at? Chapter 9, verse 38. He said, Master, we've been over in this other town and there was a man there casting out demons in your name. Should we forbid him? And uh, Jesus said, don't forbid him. He said, if he's operating in my name, he's one of us. Leave him alone. 
If he's not against us, he's for us. And oh, how we hear people, I hear ministers, I hear pastors put down other pastors because they preach a little different. They have a different style. They do church a little different way than they do. Well, are they preaching Jesus Christ? Well, then they're on our side. Don't put them down, Jesus said. Turn them loose. Let them minister. Maybe you couldn't reach that side type of people they're reaching. Their service may look different than your church service. Their style, the way they dress, the way they comb their hair, the way they operate could be different. As long as Jesus Christ is offered as Lord, the only way of salvation, that puts them on our team. So don't put them down. I did learn that, praise God, in seminary. And I'm glad I learned that in an early stage of my ministry. And prayerfully, you're operating in that same way. Well, then out of seminary, I got my first full-time church and, and uh, prayerfully what I've learned through these years in church, it'll help you as you go through also. And it was in uh, Hanston, Kansas, and we had some pretty tough stuff going on in that church when I got there. They, I inherited a church that had problems. Maybe you did too. They started uh, doubting that I was even hearing from God and when I was preaching some of my sermons and basically told me that I was wrong in some of the things I was preaching and the approach I was taking. So I started questioning if God had really called me to that place and if God had even really called me to preach. I said, you sure, God, you want me in this business? Because some of these people aren't responding in a very positive way. Uh, but usually, as is the case, our trials come to only make us strong. And uh, prayerfully, that happens to you. You get stronger. You can either get better or bitter. It's your choice. But this drove me to my knees to pray and seek God. And that's not such a bad place to be, is to be forced to get on your knees. But I did have to re-examine my theology, my understanding, my view of church, my understanding of the role of pastor to make sure it wasn't just my understanding, but it's really what God wanted. And, and, but I got God's confirmation through all this because Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 says, in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. So I call some godly people, get godly counsel. I call some godly people who I know to get their counsel. And here's what some people are telling me at the church. What do you think? You know, and, and one of them was uh, one of my uh, first pastors I'd ever had uh, when, after I got married. And his counsel was, and the general counsel I got, if God has called you to preach a certain thing, you preach that no matter what. By the way, you're called the shepherd. This one uh, gave me this counsel. Shepherd means you're the leader. So stand up and lead. And don't worry about it if they like your leadership or not. You just make sure you're leading and not giving in to the whims of the people. And even though they may disagree with you, if God is leading you in a certain direction, you have to go in that direction. You have to take a stand and be willing to die for that stand. And I'd come to the point that I had to be willing to even uh, put my career on the line. I might get fired from that church, you know, if I didn't go along with what they wanted. Didn't matter. Had to obey God rather than men, even if it meant losing my job at the church. And so uh, I thought, well, I, I, I knew that I could bend to them and, and, and I could compromise to what they were asking me to do. And, and now, by the way, bending is not always so bad. Uh, you, you should bend over backwards to try to please people unless they're asking you to compromise your convictions. Paul said, I become all things to all men that by all means I might save some. And so bend when you can, but some things you can't bend on. I mean, if they want to argue over what color to paint the church, I'm not going to argue with them over that. But some things are principles of scripture that you can't bend on. So I wasn't going to compromise. Really, it was just a fresh opportunity for me to grow in another area of my life, uh, this trial that I was going through. Through. That's to give the church to the Lord. He's the Lord of the church anyhow, not me. I'm the under shepherd. He's the shepherd, just like you are. And, and every now and then you have to give the church back to its rightful owner, Jesus Christ, and take your hands off and let him shepherd however he wants to. Amen. These were God's sheep. They weren't mine. And so I told God, God, you got a problem. This is your flock, not mine. And I'm just going to let you work it out however you want to. And I'll just listen and go along with you, whatever you want to do. And quite frankly, I didn't care if the deacons and every person in the church told me they didn't like what I was preaching. That's what God had laid on my heart to preach, and that's what I preached. I preached it again and again. And of course, that was like throwing salt in their wounds, uh, as far as some of them were concerned. But things got worse at the church. Criticism, negativism, backbiting, gossiping, slandering, it just got worse. People began to take sides. And, and I continued to try to walk with my head held high and my eyes on Jesus. And, and, and it hurt. What I was going through hurt. And, uh, and, 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 but my mind, my will, and my emotions, and even my soul, it, it affected me. And it was difficult to go through that. It was hurtful. However, Christ said in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, 
Uh, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Huh. Well, I wasn't finding that too easy. And I realized it's because I must not be in the yoke with Jesus. I'm trying to operate and respond to this criticism in the flesh instead of letting Jesus respond. Jesus, you got something to say to these people? You say it. I don't have to say a word. I'm dead. Amen. And, and allow Jesus to respond in those cases. And Jesus said, my burden is light. So we find out we got this real heavy, hard burden. Uh, his burden's light. You see, he's the strong one in that yoke pulling. I just walk along beside of him. And uh, in my spirit, it wasn't difficult. But in the flesh, it was difficult. I'm not saying it wasn't difficult. That was just to the flesh. But who cares about the flesh anyhow? Because his yoke is easy. And I got before him and in the prior closet and dug in scriptures even more. And one day, I'll never forget, I was, I was in my office in this church and praying, God, uh, I don't know what's going on here in this church. And, and Jesus reminded me uh, of what he went through towards the end of his life how that they gave him that mock trial and they spit in his face, they pulled out his beard from the roots, they whipped him, they beat him, they made fun of him. And, and I thought, oh, and he did that for me. It's my sins that put Jesus on the cross. Well, Jesus, if you went through that for me, you've gone through a whole lot more suffering than I have. Thank you that you're allowing me to have a little bitty taste of what you went through. Thank you, Jesus. I can just taste a little bit of the persecution you got uh, while you were on this earth. Thank you, Father, and all the agony you went through. Thank you, you did that for me, and, and I'm just getting to taste a little bit of it. And you see, there's where some victories involved. Even in the midst of problems, my pastor friend, you can have victory. I don't care how your church is responding to you. And I, because I realize it's all up to Jesus anyhow. And, and, and so things are starting to come to a head. Things kept getting worse. Uh, and it started to come and people thought, well, maybe we should have a vote on this. And all, but I didn't feel like voting on it because uh, I had only been there a short time. And really, I didn't think I had the confidence of all the people, some of the people. And I thought, well, if I do this, it really caused a bigger stink than I think I need now or that even God wanted. So I said, God, please move me to another church. I want to go to a different church. I've led these people as far as I can lead them. And uh, that's as far as they wanted to go. It was like hitting, hitting a brick wall uh, with, all of their, with all of their lack of love, their traditions, uh, their denominationalism, and all that stuff. And, um, you know, the devil doesn't really care what the, what the issue is. Quite frankly, he wants to destroy the church and the church's witness in the community. And whether it's over what the preacher's preaching or things about the building or the styles of worship, the devil don't care. And I think he was sitting back laughing this whole time as what was going on in that church in that town. Many of the people had gotten their eyes off of Jesus and put them on issues that really didn't matter. Uh, anyhow, they made a major case out of minor things and uh, they were more concerned about these minor issues than visiting people who had a real need, than sharing the gospel with people, than evangelizing the community. They majored on the minor things of life. Uh, like the church at Corinth, uh, where Paul, you may remember at the church at Corinth, Paul wrote to them, and he said, uh, you, are, you folks at Corinth, he said, I have to speak to you as babes in Christ, for you are yet carnal. Are not there fightings and divisions within you? He says, you're, you're acting carnally. You're not acting in a mature Christian manner. And that's exactly what I was facing there with his church. One thing that I've learned over the years of pastoring, the people in a church who aren't actively involved in any kind of ministry, and they aren't actively involved in helping in the lives of other people, they aren't willing to roll up their sleeves and, and mix and mingle and get out there and really help people. Those people, really what they are, they're carnal Christians, as I used to be, and, and that's where they are in their life. And they don't have a desire to help people, but oh, they can really pick apart the pastor or nitpick on things in the church that really don't amount to anything. They go off on tangents and become negative, griping, complaining, murmuring. Oh, just say I was describing your church. Well, join the club. You know, most pastors worth their salt have been through trials like this and they've been down in the trenches. Uh, with churches like this. And, and one of the biggest committees they have in a church like that is called the Cold Water Committee. And someone comes up with a good idea how to make the church grow and the Cold Water Committee comes along and says, well, that don't work. We've never done that before and pour cold water on that person. And in fact, they're pretty cold spiritually. And it's quite a truth. I'm glad that I learned that at an early stage in my ministry. So uh, I finally did, God did lead me to resign that church. I gave him a month's notice. And, um, but I didn't have any place to go from there. So I called all my friends and said, you know of a church open anywhere that I can go pastor? Couldn't find one and nobody had any church open anywhere. And there I said, God, what am I gonna do? 
And, and God said to me, well, I called you out here to Western Kansas to preach the gospel, didn't I? And I says, yes, but I can't do it in this church. He said, well, you stay out here in Western Kansas to preach the gospel. What if I just want you to go over here to the street corner and start preaching from there? You wouldn't do that. Well, Lord, okay, I guess I'll preach from the street corner then. You know, and, and, and I said, but where am I going to live? Because I live in the church's parsonage and I have to get out of here pretty soon. And, and in, in this town I live in, there's no apartments to rent. There's no houses to rent. Where am I going to live with my wife and two kids and one on the way? Where am I going to live? And God said to me, well, what if I want you to just pack up, put your suitcase in the trunk of your car and you live out of your suitcases out of your car? What's that to you? I said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want. And I, I shared that with my wife, thank God, for a, for a godly wife. She, was packed, she had all the boxes packed, ready to move out. We had no place to move to. But she was supportive of me, which is so important for a pastor, to have your wife behind you in ministry. And, and, and so as we did that, um, I thought, well, okay, honey, this is what we're going to do. So thank God for my wife. She, she said, okay, honey, whatever, whatever God's leading us to do, that will do Two members from the church stopped by one day, and, and we, the next day we had to be out of the parsonage. Two members stopped by, and they said, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? And I said, uh, well, I guess I'll just be preaching on the street corner here in town. They said, well, where are you going to live? I said, I guess out of my car. They said, you don't have to live out of your car. This was two farmers. They said, we just bought a plot of ground out here outside of town in the country. It's got an old farmhouse on it. You can live in it if you want to for free. I said, well, I guess, okay, thank you for that. And they said, well, when Sunday rolls around, where are you going to preach? I said, I guess I'll preach in the living room of that farmhouse to my wife and two kids. And, and word got out that week, and when Sunday rolled around, oh, we'll find out next lesson what happened. God bless you.